Okay, this next tip will help alleviate uh, some misery from our two local beasts that we have down here. One is the mosquito and two is the noceum or the little sand flies. I'm not sure what the mainlanders would call them. Um, this is a tip for after if you're getting bitten and you're itching like crazy. Um, the most common remedy that people will suggest is hydro hydrocortisone cream. Um, as a topical solution that just fairly effective, especially for the mosquito bites. Um, some people it works really well, some people it doesn't. Now for noceums, a lot of times it's, for some reason, it's not as effective. And I learned this trick from a uh, pharmacist friend of mine who's an, also an outdoorsman. And this is the remedy he totally recommends to everybody that comes to see him at the counter. Um, it's also, he says he uses it for most any type of topical itches. And he says it works really well, so I started trying it, and it does work really good. And that is to basically use antiperspirant, okay? Not, well, deodorant in general name, but what you're looking for is the antiperspirant. And the reason what you're looking for there is uh, the active ingredient in a antiperspirant is aluminum zirconium. Read that there. And the way it basically works is that um, aluminum zirconium is a type of aluminum salt. And what it does is that you get a bite, um, you put that on there. Yeah, since it's like a salt, it'll absorb the liquid. Um, so when they bite and then they inject their um, anticoagulants in there so that they can suck out the blood and the moisture out of you, uh, the aluminum salt you put on there will kind of pull that out. But the other thing that it does is that it'll seal the bite so even if you scratch it a bit and you have that open wound there, um, that drying effect will help it close off quicker. Um, generally the way it, I find it works is I'll get a bite or whatnot, and then I'll come home, it's itchy, that crazy, it's driving me nuts. Well, like I've got one down my wrist. Um, I'll just get this out, run it over, and then it's an instant stops the itch right away. It just numbs it off and it's, you just don't feel anything and it's great. Then if you wait a mi minute or so, then it starts feeling a little itchy, like it's going back to being itchy again. Then what I do is I just hit it one more time and it's just like reapplying it does it. I imagine you could just use the surrounding stuff and just kind of mix it in, but I always just hit it a second time. And then after that, it's done. It doesn't come back. And I think that might be that uh, drying effect, pulling it out, it might not get it all, but then you hit it again and that pretty much knocks it out. And uh, that stops the itch really well. Um, definitely it's helped out quite a few people on the uh, noceums because like I said the hydrocortisone doesn't always work um, all the normal uh, uh, lidocaine all that kind of stuff doesn't seem to work as well but uh, very good solution again you don't want to get deodorant that's just perfumes to, to mask it you want to get the active ingredient to be an antiperspirant or some sort of the aluminum zirconium that aluminum salt so there you go this tip is going to be about saving money on buying fishing stuff. Now, specifically, it'll be about buying fishing stuff and saving money at Kmart or Sears. But then I'm not sure how applicable it is for everybody else. Um, we've got one here in Key West, Kmart here in Key West, and we also have one in Marathon. Uh, both of them have a pretty good selection of fishing stuff because you're in the Keys. Uh, but then again, I don't know how much fishing stuff other uh, Kmart's might on the mainland. But if you are, if you happen to be down here, the way I save a lot of money on fishing stuff actually is by signing up for this uh, Shop Your Way membership. Um, it's through Kmart and Sears because they're uh, partners. But basically, when you sign up for it, they send you a bunch of different offers. Um, some of their offers that you'll see down here is. Uh, I get these a lot. There's a $5 off of a $15 in sporting goods. So you spend $15, they take off $5 at the register. Um, I get them five for 15, five for 20. Um, you can get them up for like 20 off of $60 or something. A bunch of different variable ones, but this one's the most common one I get is $5 off 15. So 33% off right off the bat. So that's a pretty good deal right there. Uh, another deal I get quite a bit is they have these, uh, three dollars off three dollars or five dollars off five dollars or I used, I used to get I don't see them very often anymore but the get uh, ten dollars off ten dollars um, and basically all that is is that you get those items 
free if you match the dollar. So let's uh, just three dollars for three dollars. If I go on there and I see a lure for three dollars, I just get that, take it up to the register, show them my uh, account number, and then it automatically deducts three dollars, and then I'm out the door with the item basically for free, or whatever dividends they are. So I, mean, I get those usually, but both of these about once a week. Um, and then you see this one, $8 off of $40. So that's how I save considerable decent right off the bat. And then you also get some points back, but that's never a big deal. Um, another thing that's a really beneficial that, I, that they have is I get... These deals as well. And they've got them through um, pretty much when you're that Shop Your Way member, you get $2 back in points for any time you buy a fishing lure. And what they mean by $2 back in points is basically $2 credit to your account. So the next time you come in and you give them their card, uh, they'll deduct $2 off of your next purchase. So it's basically uh, good for your next purchase. So $2 back for every any type of lure. So it doesn't matter what kind of lure, you get two bucks back. So the way that really works out for an example, like I'll go in there and I'll buy, like I'm going to use this, uh, this the, the main scan that I use is uh, this 5 off of 15. So I'll go in there and I'll buy, let's say, three packs of uh, gulp shrimps. They're five bucks a bag, so I get three of those, 15 bucks. Go up to the register, give my card, they knock off five bucks, so that gets them down to ten dollars for three bags. Then... Because I have that uh, lure special deal, $2 back for each lure I get, they send me $2 for each pack, so I get $6 back into my account. So that basically makes it $4 for three bags of $5 gulp packages. So for $15 worth of gulp, I basically pay $4 for them. So I get these offers every week. So I use them to stock up when I want to buy lures and that kind of stuff. It really works out well. Um, or if I have to buy something bigger, I'll wait for the bigger discount ones. But that's a pretty good deal if you uh, use it effectively there. Um, I'll show you our sh the store that uh, local Kmart store here. And this is that sign about the $2 back in points. Let's get through October 29th. It's been, I've been using it since July when they started it. But you can kind of see, they've got a pretty good selection of uh, uh, soft plastics, lures, trolling lures. They've got pretty good, uh, all the pretty good lures there. And then all the weights, lines, hooks, fishing accessories, um, braided lines. They sell bait, chum, fishing poles. Pretty good selection here. The one in Marathon actually is even a little bit larger. Um, but uh, anyways, that's my local Kmart there. So that's kind of a good way to save money if you have a Kmart that sells uh, fishing supplies. Okay, for my next tip, uh, this is gonna be about rod floats. Um, I actually had a few people, and uh, a lot of times when I go on other people's boats, they always ask, what, what's that thing on your rod for? Which are basically these. Um, this is electrical conduit, or sometimes you use uh, just pull noodle. Pull noodle. But what they're for is they prevent the rod from sinking. Uh, one of the major problems with kayak fishing is that you tend to lose a lot of gear. Um, the most common thing is saying is basically if you, if you value it, you're going to either uh, tie it up or you're going to have some sort of a float attached to it. So with the rods, um, it's just so easy to drop anything overboard and you're talking uh, pretty good money on this stuff. Um, it could be just you're rigging something, not paying attention, it falls over, jumps, uh, hits some water, falls off your uh, rod holder. I've had that happen. Multiple different things happen and they go overboard. Uh, fishing poles and rods, uh, reel rods and reels, they sink and it's gone. And a lot of times the problem is, is that you don't even realize it. Um, if you did realize that it was there, then you'd go around and get it if you didn't know it. But a lot of times you just go out and you come back and you had four rods and then all of a sudden you have three rods and you're just at a loss. While with the rod float, if it does go over, it'll just float there and you have a chance at uh, going back and getting it. So that's what they're for. Now, one of the negative things on it, and I got a comment about this, a guy commented and said, oh God, I hate your, when you cast with that rod thing, cause it flop, 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 cause the, 
the loose slack line rubs against it and it click, 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 clicks. And I was like, yeah, it does. It's, it is kind of annoying. Um, since I'm doing a lot more uh, uh, flats fishing type of thing with artificials where I'm uh, going for distance is more important. Um, I went ahead and cut off the uh, the rod floats off of my um, light tackle stuff. Um, but to prevent the risk of me losing them, I've come up a basically a removable rod float. Okay, and that's what I'm going to kind of show you now. And this will be for those people just in that situation. They want that uh, preventive uh, buoyancy item on there, but yet they don't want to have to deal with it when they're actually using it. Okay, so you just get like a regular pull noodle. Okay, and just going to cut off a section, basically just what will fit in there comfortably. Um, you can test it by throwing it in a fresh water or your swimming pool or whatnot. Um, I wouldn't do it in salt water because of the reel, but your choice there. So you just have a hollow pull noodle. Then what, the, what you're going to do is you're going to cut the slit instead of normally you would cut the slit so you're just going to put it on there, zip tie it or whatnot. Um, when this way you're going to cut it into like a barbershop pole at a diagonal and just so that it basically rotates around and uh, when you do that you're going to be able to twist it on like a corkscrew onto your rod and then that's going to make it very stable it's not going to come off but yet you can be able to peel it off and just take it off when you're going to be casting so all you'll do is just basically get a knife start a cut and then you're going to just cut at an angle And then I've got it cut, so it's kind of at a even pitch of an angle there, which will allow you to basically spin it on, but yet it won't um, come off very easily on its own. So now it's on there, okay, it's not going to shake off uh, because of that diagonal cut, I mean, you can't get it off, and even then getting it off, you have to find the slot and then twist it off. So you've got the pull float there. Uh, your rod is safe as you're going from A to B out to the fishing spot. Once you get out there, find the opening, twist it off, and you're good to go. You'll hear that flapping sound. It's not causing you distance by flapping on that. Um, you're finished up. Throw it back on. Pretty quick and easy. And then rod holder and go to your next spot and you're safe and secure. There you go. Okay, for this next tip, it's going to be about uh, replacing broken rod tips and guides. Now I've got this um, Abu Garcia Veritas, uh, 7.6, medium heavy, and I've got it with my uh, Revo, Abu Garcia Revo SX. This was my old um, bass uh, crankbait rod, but uh, I was wanting to use it for throwing top water at some of those uh, small tarpon, but it had a broken rod tip on it. I actually put a new tip on it already on my last recording, but of course, freaking SD card error, error which I've been getting lately, and it's, it's very pissing me off. But uh, we'll all go over that now. But um, I'll show you how to basically take this thing off and put one back on, regardless if it's been replaced. So you basically, let's say you have a broken tip here, um, this is a good DIY for if you're a beginner fisherman, okay? You just, if you're watching all these videos and you definitely know that you want to be a, well, not a professional fisherman, but really get into fishing and you want to start learning things, replacing a rod tip is a real basic, um, very easy, low cost, but it'll get you that, uh, get your feet wet and get your confidence going that you could fix some of this stuff. I would do this before I would get into like taking apart your spinning reel and so forth. But basically, um, you can go down to any little uh, bait and tackle shop, Walmart, Kmart, wherever, and, and uh, pick up one of these little uh, fishing rod tip replacements. Usually you get like three tips, and then you'll get a stick of glue. This is just basically um, hot glue gun glue. So if you've got a hot glue gun, don't even worry about buying the glue, but most of the time you get the tips. Um, one way to get the tips if you've got the glue is, um, I go down to my local West Marine, and they have the, the, the bulk pack of uh, rod tips on there. So generally they expect you to bring your rod in 
and they'll put a new tip on for you, charge you two, three bucks or whatever. But I usually take the broken tip in there, and they match it up, and then they just give it to me because there's no way to ring up just the 20 cent uh, rod tip. So that's how I just get them. But anyways, um, once you've got that, all you have to do is have a, a lighter to heat it up because it's just hot glue, and that'll loosen it up. You can take the tip off and then a uh, pair of pliers because when you put it back on the tip will be hot because you're going to use the lighter to heat it up and then a little knife or switch blade um not switch blade but a, a little razor blade to cut the little shavings off of the glue stick there so the first thing that we're going to do is just going to heat up that tip and you don't want to cook it you just want to warm it up so that you get that glue soft because if you do it too much you're going to uh hurt the rod so it just slips right off as soon as that heat hits that glue, it softens up and it'll just slide right off. And that's the old tip there. You'll just match up the tip with the closest tip. The, the diameter of the tip, I don't find is that important. I usually actually switch out a lot of my rod tips to a larger because I'm throwing, um, using braid and then I'm, my connection from the braid to the uh, uh, leader tends to be a knot and then this will prevent putting on a larger diameter tip will prevent that from sticking and then breaking your knot up and causing problems when you're reeling in the fish so I don't find that a problem but what you want to do is to match the diameter of the rod tip housing part of it with the rod tip so that it's fairly snug and not too loose then what you'll do is you'll get your um, knife and your glue stick and you're just going to get little shavings off I mean, just tiny little shavings. That's why it's kind of sometimes better to use a, uh, a razor versus a knife. Oops, let me get it off. I'm shooting them off everywhere. Okay, so once you've got these, just some tiny little slivers in there. You're just going to stick those slivers inside the metal tip. And the reason why you're not uh, using heating up the glue stick and uh, applying the glue, hot glue to directly to the tip is because you try to want to minimalize the amount of heat putting on the tip. And plus, people tend to put too much glue and it'll gob up if you have too much. By putting it in here, any excess will get pushed down all the way to the end of the tip, and that way it won't glob up on the uh, back part of it there. So once you've got that, use your pliers. I'm going to hold on to the tip very lightly, just by the tube there. You don't want to ever touch the ceramic part with the metal, get any chips on there or anything. Get the whole ladder out. And you're just going to cook it just ever so slightly, just enough to get it gooed up. Okay. It's definitely when it's smoking, it's good. And you're going to pop that on there. And then you could twist it. And you've got time, so no rush. And to try to get it centered with the other guides. Then you can eyeball it. Long ways is the best way. Hey, got it. So I'm good there, and in a, give it a minute to uh, minute to cool off, and then you're done, and your tip is replaced, and you're back on the road again. Now switching to that, now let's talk about guides. Um, I should put this away. Like I had a guide that broke on. My nicer rod that I use a lot, which is this uh, Shimano Terramar. My, uh, it's a medium heavy. It's probably my go-to rod for pretty much everything. But uh, I had cracked a uh, guide on this one. The ceramic broke off. And uh, so I was gonna go ahead and just replace it myself and just try to DIY it. And um, I was kind of, uh, cause I knew I could do it. It would turn out probably kind of crappy, but just to get it back so I could start using it again. So I went down to the local um, uh, rod and reel repair place, and there's only one, and it's actually this company here. It's a Esky Rods. So, or if you just go online to eskyrods.com, uh, 
they're the only place in town that actually uh, repairs and uh, fixes uh, rods and reels and carry uh, parts for reels, which is a good thing for me because I just fix my own so I can just go down there and uh, buy the part over the counter. But um, I went down there for the, the guide replacement and it was going to be, I think, four bucks or five bucks just to buy the guide, which is okay. It's not like you can find them anywhere. And then uh, even ordering them online is tough because how do you know exactly what size it's going to be? So um, I was happy that he had them and was going to sell me that way. But then I asked him how much would it be for him to just replace it for me. And it was 13 bucks. Um, so with tax, $14 out the door. And for, so basically for 7 or $8 more, he was going to basically do it. And it's going to be just like brand new. I mean, you can't tell the difference between the old one and the new one. And I couldn't even tell. I forgot which guide it was. I had to look at the rust on the other guides to tell which one was the replacement one. So you get a nice new replacement. They, they have, he builds custom rods. So you can go down there and buy a custom rod. You could take down your grandfather's old uh, fishing rod and they'll basically make it brand new again. So they've got total skills, all the equipment and everything for it. Uh, it's a father and son operation. So they've been in, in around for years. Um, and just get out the door. So in that regards, I probably would recommend if you have a decent rod, um, it's worth it to spend a couple bucks, five, six, seven bucks, and then just have it done professionally. That way everything matches, it looks good, and you know it's right. On the flip side, I had this rod I talked about earlier. I found it in the mangroves where some people had just chunked it because it was pretty thrashed. The rod, the reel was all gummed up and locked up. Um, the guides were all bent up. The top tip was broken off about five or six inches on it, it was missing a tip. So what I had done is um, I went ahead and just put a tip on just like we did. But the problem with it is where it broke off. This second guide, or actually it was probably the third guide, but uh, was basically right here. So it looked kind of funky having the normal spacing and then have this two inches between uh, the tip and that first guide. So what I did is I cut it off, cleaned it up, and then I just used black thread and just hand wound it on there and then use some dollar store epoxy and basically glued it on. So it came out all right. I mean, it's definitely 100% usable, but it just doesn't look very good. And for a $120 rod, I kind of want it to look good versus this throwaway. This works perfectly, so you can do it yourself. Um, most of the time when you wrap guides, it, you, you need kind of a, um, a rod turning machine that does the constant turning so you could put constant um, pressure on the threads and then when you do the epoxying or painting, that with the rod turning, it doesn't get any buildup. It's just nice and smooth with your end result. And especially as it's drying, it doesn't sag anywhere. Um, but uh, without that, I just hand did it. So it came out, it came out all right. So it just depends on what you want to do. If you're totally in doing it yourself, not still caring about it being perfect, then definitely you can do it yourself. But uh, anyways, um, that's the tip there. Like I said, uh, if you're in Key West, uh, broken rod, broken reel, uh, want a custom rod. Um, like I said, they carry um, components for most of the major manufacturer reels, so it's very convenient, and it's the only place down in the lower keys that I have. In the keys in general, I don't know any other places up the keys either, so um, if you're in a pinch, that's definitely the way to go. So anyways, thank you on that tip. Okay, this tip is about uh, braided line maintenance. Um, if my last jigging trip, I ended up losing a fish um, pulling off the wreck and it didn't bite through the leader, shark didn't get it, it was just the braided line gave out. And um, prior to that trip, I had uh, re, re, uh, run a new leader line onto it and I could see that the braid was uh, kind of worn out. Um, I'm cycling one year on this braid and as you know, Salt water corrosion kills everything, including your braided line. Um, one you can easily tell that they're getting tired is by the coloration. Um, that's my one year old braid on there. That's some 65 pound uh, Power Pro, the dark green stuff. Um, this is the color it should be. Um, this I just pulled not more than a week ago. It had one trip on it so far. So far, that's a 10 pound. Uh, Power Pro, but you can see by the coloration differences that, yeah, it's uh, it's been time, and I'm I've basically uh, sun bleached it, and it's worn out, and it's 
needing some uh, refurbishing. Now there's a couple ways that you can do it. Um, you can go through and just pull off 20, 30, 50, 100 feet of it and just cut that off. I actually did after I lost that fish, I cut off probably a good 20 feet of it because um, it was even worse to wear than this where it's starting to get a little fuzzy looking. And I just cut it back and then I, I retold it up knowing that I was holding off to make this video so that's kind of why I waited so long. But you can cut up, cut back the really worn ends just like if uh, you have dry split ends you can cut those off. Um, that's one way of doing it. But for me that's kind of a waste because it's still fairly strong it'll still work in most circumstances. So the way I'm going to do it is I'm going to make use of all that uh, fishing hoarding that uh, most long-term fishermen do. So I've got these old uh, reels that have no line on them or very little line on it. I use as line savers. And um, basically what I'm going to do is I'm going to rehab this line by flip-flopping it. So I'm going to take the old stuff that's not old stuff, it's all the same age, but the stuff that's really worn and I'm going to put that as the beginning of the on the reel spool. And then so when I reel it up, the stuff that's been buried and covered and protected from the sun and the salt for most of the time is going to be at the top. So it should be fairly almost new again. And the way I'm going to do that is that I'm going to put this reel on another rod and then I'm going to unreel it onto here. Now you can't go right back to it because it'll end up the same. So you have to do one more step, which is then to reel it onto another reel, which is why I have the second reel. And then once that's on there, then I can convert it back to the original reel and it'll be flip flopped uh, 180 degrees there. Okay. Now that's the technique I'm going to do there. You could also, if you're on a boat or something, you could just tie it to a tree and just run until it's empty, walk back, untie it from the tree and then reel it up again. You can tie it to your dog and send them running. There's a bunch of different ways, but this is nice for convenience. I stay in the air conditioning and don't get killed by a hurricane outside if there happens to be one. Okay. The other thing that that method is good for is if you are using um, a leader or mono as a filler, a backing they call it. So like a lot of times you want to fill a, the capacity to the capacity. It's definitely like this jigging rod where the more capacity the better. Okay, it's uh, not only more capacity in case you get a big fish that runs, specifically like on my trolling rods, this jigging rod that will take a lot of leader and uh, you have the risk of losing all your line. Um, but two, the larger the diameter that you keep the line, the more full it is, the more line increase every time you reel. So the fuller it is, one revolution will take more line than if it was only half filled. So that way if you fill it to capacity, it's actually a better thing. And the way you could do that is if you do use um, a backing, a mono backing, is that you first you take your braided line on an empty reel, you fill the spool with the braided line, okay? Then you attach your mono backing or whatever you're gonna do as a backing, and you attach it to the braid, and then you reel it, reel it until it's totally to the, the, the fullness that you want it. Okay, it's perfect. Then your, your capacity is right, it's just your flip-flop. You want the braid on the outside and that backing on the inside. Then you just do what we just did here. Then you basically go from that rod reel to this reel, this reel to this reel, and then this reel flip flops it and puts it back so it's reversed on this reel. And then you're done. Your capacity is exactly perfect. Um, that's kind of the way that I did for this reel here, as you can see. I maxed it out by using backing, doing that reversal thing. So it's, it's basically right to the full there. So even though I'm using 10 pound, and a 10 pound um, has a two pound mono diameter, it probably would have only spill, uh, filled this spool about a third of the way. Normally it's not too bad to be even just half away, but a third was just a little too light. So I went ahead and did the backing on it. But that's the way we're gonna do that. So I'm gonna go ahead and do that real quick so you can check it out. And then you could see the uh, end result of the flip flopping the, the uh, braid. Okay, I've got it all set up. I'm using my, uh, my old, most favorite uh, rod, that old noodle rod. It's a two-piecer, so it works out perfectly. I just use the bottom half, and then I've got it uh, tied off to the first uh, guide there, and then back to the reel there. And then I'm just going to uh, reel it all up. Oops. Good guide. 
and get all the line on here. All right, all done. See, nice dark green again. So I'm good for another year. And no more losing fishes because I'm lazy. There you go.